Okay, well, hello and welcome, Shalom. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Beautiful Shabbat. It got, yeah, you know, a little warm this afternoon down in Southern Command, but uh, right now, very pleasant, nice east wind, uh, cooling off, and uh, life is good. What a time to uh, enjoy the fellowship, one and another, different locations all across the world that this is going out and i'm excited let's go ahead and open with prayer and we'll get into today's study father god i thank you and praise you for everything that you've given i ask father god that your presence be with us and that it would move and go out to the people to the needs to the opportunity to glorify your name father god I command that this word go forward unhindered and that it would do the work, it would take root and it would bring forth good fruit for your glory, for your kingdom. Father God, right now, anoint the words, anoint the teaching to break every yoke of bondage. And we ask it, Father, and glorify your name. In the name of Yeshua, amen. All right. You know, uh, uh, I'm going to have to, I don't know if I'd call it stealing, maybe plagiarize a little bit. Uh, Prophet Steve liked to use this a couple of times in some of his teaching, that uh, theme song of, of cops, you know, bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do? Uh, that's kind of that's kind of where we're going today. What are you going to do when they come for you? And uh, I know many of you are going, great, now I can't get that song out of my head. That's all right. Thank me tomorrow after it's run through all night long and you're going, bad boys, bad boys, just stop it. You know, you're going to wake up 2 o'clock in the morning for prayer, bad boys. No, no. You know what? We've got to have fun. And I, I appreciate humor and laughter. Laughter does the heart good like a medicine, right? And it's scientific. Uh, proven that it releases certain chemicals in the body that heal and help restore. So uh, uh, humor me in my attempts at humor. Okay, and we thank you. Go to Acts 12th chapter. We're going to start there. And as I was preparing this morning, uh, of course, like a lot of mornings, we finished up the uh, uh, teaching on the covenant and, and everything that was, was gone in there. And I enjoyed that series so much. It, it enlightened and it gave us all a good base and a good teaching tool for, for those youngsters that are coming into uh, uh, this movement, this Torah lifestyle. And, and it was a great study. But like all good things, it must come to an end. So you got to start over again. And I'm sitting there with a very good cup of coffee this morning. And... Uh, watching the sun come up and praising God and saying, okay, Father, what do you want to do today? What do you want to teach? What do you want to tell your people? What message can I convey to them that will help them, uplift them, and prepare them for what's coming? Because we all know there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. We also know, if you know anything and study any Bible prophecy, that it's going to get worse before it gets any better. So we're going to start here. I just happened to, did one of those things, you know, it kind of sounds super spiritual, flaky, whatever. Just open the Bible and start there, whatever, whatever happens. Well, that's kind of what happened. And then it developed from there. So we're going to go on. Follow with me, if you will. Chapter 12, verse 1 of the King James. Now about the that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James the brother of John with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So it was in the spring, it was during the feast of matzah, unleavened bread, and oh Herod, uh, had a thing for the church, for the new church leaders, those followers of Messiah. He killed James uh, earlier. We see some of Saul, who now we know as 
Paul the Apostle, uh, some of his antics, and we're going to go back and look at that real quick when he uh, stood by while they stoned Stephen, and all the other things that are going on. And we want to look at some of these today because I think it's relative, uh, relevant, excuse me, to the social atmosphere that we see today. Public leaders that do something and then then on Facebook they get a bunch of people that applaud their actions so they feel empowered to go the next step. They feel like, okay, uh, they love me. They really love me. Well, maybe if I do this, they'll love me more. And that's exactly what old Herod was doing because he saw that what he did there made him more popular with the religious establishment, with some people that maybe he was on the outs on with some of the things. So whatever his reasons, it wasn't out of a heart of love. He didn't show much fruit when he was doing this, right? Well, he showed fruit, bad fruit. Now, in verse 4, And when he had apprehended him, Peter that is, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quatrains of soldiers to keep him. So that's four sets of four soldiers, right? Intending after Easter, it says in the King James, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, to bring him forth to the people. He was going to put him on trial. He was probably uh, going to be executed. There's probably, it was probably going to be a dog and pony show, and Peter was, was going to be executed. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Never underestimate in the days to come when we hear about our brothers or sisters who have been apprehended, who are going through trials, politically, religiously, whatever the trials are, we need to be better intercessors. That's takeaway number one in all of this. Intercession is crucial. You may think, well, what? I'm just one person. What does my prayer matter? What, what goes on? Remember, the prayers of a righteous man or woman avails much. We're going to see this play out. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, so, so the night before he was going to go on trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door of the pres door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. He poked him. He said, Peter. Hey, wake up. And raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Interestingly enough, not only did the chains go off, the angels there, the lights all around, everybody else is sound asleep. They never move. We're talking 16 soldiers, trained soldiers that knew that if this prisoner escaped, they were toast. Yet somehow they were all fast asleep. Miracle number one. And the angel said unto him, gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he says, pointing, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. What a commotion. Yet yeah, you can almost imagine Peter going, shh, shh, shh. he's trying to put on a, somebody like the old show, snores and rolls over. They think, oh, wait a minute. It had to be a show, you know. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. I'm dreaming. This is all a dream, right? When they were past the first and second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of its own accord. So it's kind of like those, those movie things where they come up to it and all of a sudden the gates just, boom, miraculously opened up that were supposed to be locked, right? And they went out and passed on through one street 
and forthwith the angel departed from him. He got him out to safety. He got him outside the danger zone. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod from all the expectations of the peoples of the Jews. Now he knew that the Jews were driving a lot of what Herod was doing, right? And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came and hearkened named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Isn't that precious? She was so excited to hear Peter's voice, she forgot to let him in. And she took out, Peter, 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 he's at the gate. And they said unto her, thou art mad. But she consistently affirmed that it was even so. Then they said, well, it must be his angel. Now, takeaway number two. When we pray, do we really believe God is able to deliver? Valid question. Apparently, these guys couldn't believe that Peter could have been standing at the door. This, this young lady could have been right. Would we, and I don't want to throw rocks, put yourself in their position. Would you, being in your house, praying for, for Peter in prison, knowing tomorrow might be the last day Peter takes a breath after this uh, mock trial that Herod was going to put on, would we have believed that this, this girl come up and said, Peter's at the gate? We've got to believe. We've got to know. I can't tell you for sure. If I was standing there in that position, like I said, I don't want to throw rocks. I'm praying for this. But do I really believe that there's a chance it could happen? Think about it. Meditate on it. Do we really believe when we pray? Or are we just hoping that God hears us and God will deliver and God will answer our prayers? Think about it, guys. I'll tell you what. I'm preaching to myself. The rest of you are enjoying the benefit of hearing me preach to myself is what this amounts to. We all go through things, and, and lately, it seems like all of us, our faith has been pushed into the corner, and you know what? We need to develop that faith more and more and more, and it's got to come stronger to where we know that we know, right? Now, but Peter, verse 16, continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Praise God, there's Peter. But he, beckoning them with the hand, told them to hold their peace. Can you imagine? I'm escaped prison guard. Shh, quiet. Declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren, and he departed and went into another place. He's on the run. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers that what was become of Peter. Well, I imagine not. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined, he put the, the guards on trial. So Herod, after trying, after he knew he lost Peter, uh, he went down and, and was highly displeased with Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord, having made Blastus, the king's chamber, their friend, desiring peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. In other words, they were indebted. If something happened, they were in trouble. They were going to go hungry. And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, 
and made an oration unto them. He made great words, a great speech in all his kingly attire, right? And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God, not of a man. Now Herod, instead of uh, giving praise to God for everything that he's done, what's he do? Look at this. And the people gave a shout saying, it's the voice of a God, not a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Maggots came on him almost instantly. He was consumed right before their eyes. Do you think God was trying to put a put something there to say, don't mess with my church, my apostles, my emissaries? Herod, you stepped over the bounds. You took glory to yourself, you're done. How many times have we not seen that through history where kings start to get a little bit uh, more conceited than they should be? And they're taken out. Be careful if you're a leader. There's the next takeaway in this. Be careful if you're in leadership not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Don't do it. You're a servant. Yeshua himself said, if you come into a, a, a wedding feast, take the lower seat. And then if somebody sees you and brings you up, great. But don't come in and take the higher seat when somebody of more importance comes in and tells you to go down to the kids table. We are servants, one to another. Get that in your spirit and we won't have the power struggle. We won't have the stuff going on that we see across the entire church and Judah and the whole rest of everything. This whole religious thing is about people building themselves up to be some great whatever that is. No, it's not. You know what I love about John the Baptist? He was a country boy. He ran around outside. He was rough. He was tough. He wasn't refined. He didn't have a big church or a big synagogue. He didn't sit in a glass office. He was real. And he laid it on the line, and he did not puff himself up to be some great thing, even though he knew, and Yeshua even said it, that this was a great one in the kingdom of God. Boy, somebody, please, somebody listen to me. Don't puff yourself up. That's what happens. 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul re returned from, Jer from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. End of chapter. We got a lot of takeaways from that. Now, what is all this with the bad boys thing? I want to go through and look at a few places where we had trouble here in the book of Acts. We're just going to stay in Acts for a little bit. And then we're going to move around and just pay attention to the nuances and look at today's headlines and look at what was going on there and see if you can draw any correlations between it, right? So go back over to Acts 7, 54. Acts 7, 54. And when they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with their cheek with their teeth but he and this is the stoning of Stephen right he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus Yeshua standing on the right hand of God and said behold I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God and they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. 
And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord, Stephen, as they stoned him, calling upon God and saying, Lord, Yeshua, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Again, what a guy. I don't know if I could do that. My flesh wants to rip out and say, Father, justice. Father, vengeance. Father, repay them in spades, right? We put them in the dirt. Is that the, what, we're, what we're shown to do here? Yeah, it's tough. But what happened? The crowd got worked up. There's a spirit loose on the face of the earth today that incites, it gets in and it just works and works and works. That same spirit was back there in Yeshua's day. It was back there in the apostles' days. Remember how many times Yeshua would do something and the crowd went to grab him and he had to basically do a Sodom and Gomorrah and blind them and walk through the middle and take off? That same spirit that's stirring people up is rampant today. Why do you think all the all the different alphabet soup, you know, LBG, BLM, all the rest of them, Antifa, neo Nazis, uh, uh, Marxism, socialism, communism, all these isms are nothing but spirits that are sent to take peace from the earth. And it's going to get worse, unfortunately, brothers and sisters. I'd like to tell you there's a great revival coming, and we will be victorious. We will be victorious, but some of our victory may come through death. I'm sorry to say it, but I want to prepare you. I want to warn you so that this isn't a surprise. You've got to understand that this is coming. Now, after all this, uh, let's go to uh, uh, Acts 14. Actually, Acts 8, on the way over there, Acts 8, flip over one time, 1 through 3. Acts chapter 8. And Saul was consent unto his death, and at that time there was great persecution against the church was at, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And I want to get back to that. Remember that. Because what they did was exactly what Yeshua told them to do. And I want to get back to that. Guys, to think that there is just one place Scripture doesn't bear that out. We've got to be ready to move, to be mobile, to, to push this thing around. And it's Yeshua was the one that started. We're going to look at that. Now, 14, Acts 14, 1. Acts 14, 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they were brought together in the synagogue, both Jews and and so spake that a multitude of both Jews and also Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews, the religious crowd. Could we say today the unbelieving church? The unbelieving one world religion? It's coming. Insert whoever is stirring things up. But he, they stirred up the Gentiles, and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. That same spirit. Stir in the pot, stir in the pot, stir in the pot, right? 
long time before, or, or long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave them testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done in their hand. Look, verse four, but the multitude of the city was divided, part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and stone them, they were aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, the cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. You know what? There's a pattern being laid here, brothers and sisters. Sometimes that thing's going to stir up. Sometimes you got to be ready to leave everything you have behind and be able to go and start all over. We were just talking about that the other night. And I think that was a prophetic statement. How little did I know it would show up here tonight? Go over to verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. They stirred him up to the point of murder, lynching. How many people do we see today? I just read a note this afternoon where a young mother in Indiana was trying to have a discussion and she was shot. There were people that, another young lady, a young mother in their 20s, just because they were white. This is wrong. And it's, it's all that spirit. It's not necessarily the people. It's the spirit that's gotten a hold of them and stirred them up. And it's bad. What are we going to do? What are you going to do when they come for you? Right? What are you going to do? Paul got stoned. And then they, the, how be it here again, verse 20. You got to read that. How be it as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day departed with Barnabas to Derby. Now, wait a minute. Stoning is not pretty. And stoning is a fairly painful way to go. I can imagine. I've never been stoned. I've been hit with a few rocks. And yeah, even one time I had a, a work boot threw down a hallway and hit me upside the head. But that's another story. Um, it's not pleasant. And yet Paul jumped up, maybe dusted off, went, okay. And the next day went on a trip. I might have been sitting around licking my wounds for a week or so to recover. But yet the power of God through the, the other believing members was strong enough to heal him and get him back on his road. Praise God that we have that kind of power available to us today. It wasn't just for them. The same spirit that was in these guys can be is in us. You've got to understand that. This isn't just a one-off. The church, the enemy tried to say, well, miracles stopped back here. I'm here to say, no, they haven't. Somebody asked me the other day, a question came up. Why don't we see miracles in the church? Well, you're probably hanging around the wrong crowd because we see them all the time. I just got a note from a dear brother that once again, Father God touched him, healed, here, never laid hands on him. Got a word of knowledge, prayed for somebody with a deviated symptom. He held his hand to his nose. His nose is healed. He can breathe, and he hasn't been able to breathe since he was a child. Miraculous. And that wasn't the first time this brother's gotten touched. Over the last couple of years, this particular brother 
has been touched over and over. And I am so thrilled because I know his story. And if anybody deserves what he's getting right now, brother, I know you're watching, you do. And again, I got to get off of it because I'm almost in tears. I'm so excited to see what God will do. And there's many others of you that are watching right now. I know God's power. We serve a living God. This isn't just a dead God of the Bible that we're reading. He's not just some fish head God that we make a totem to. This is a living creative force that we call Daddy, Father. Isn't that, it's amazing that he loves us so much. He came through time and eternity to be with us today. Praise God. Praise God forever. Verse 22. And here is the key. I'm going to go to verse 21 in that. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Is it going to be an easy trip home? Not at all. I'm sorry to say, brace yourself. Get ready. But isn't it great to know we have a power and a hope and a rescue plan that's already in place? I'll tell you, you got to underline that. You've got to get it in your heart. We can't truly learn to live until we're ready to die. I've said that before. We've got to get that if we know that we know that we know, that's what's driving so much fear with this COVID thing and everything else that's going on. Had a little wind. Did I not tell you we had a beautiful wind going on? The lighting is drawn. <laughs> Praise God. But you know what? We have a way of escape. And the Father knows but we've got to, with much tribulation, we've got to be tried. We've got to be tested. Yes, the trials will come. Yes, you'll get a healing and then go, wait a minute, what's that twinge? And then at that very moment, you can either say, hell no. No, 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 no. We ain't going to have this. Satan, I'm healed, period. And you go on. And that's what this is all about. And you ask for the prayer for, man, I, 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 this is what's going on. Can I get another shot? And you know what? It's wonderful when that all works. So, Acts 16, 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying, and the same followed Paul and us, cried aloud, these are men, these men are servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. And this she did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out of the, out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude, the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. 
And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. They were beaten, they were mocked. I'm sure they were, they were smacked around without a trial, without a hearing, without anything else, mob rule. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we're all here. And then he called for a light and he sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Talk about getting shook up. This old boy was. And brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know what? We're going to be in situations that are going to test our faith. And those same situations may be one of the greatest times of evangelism that we know. We might be put in a position, we might be put on trial, but it's just where God wants us to touch a life or a number of lives. What must I do to be saved? 31, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his straightway. What a guy, Paul, been beaten, thrown in prison, and yet was willing to bring a salvation message and baptize a household of believers into the faith. Wow. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. And that's, that's when, you know, so I... I like every now and again how Paul works. He said, nah, you know what? They put us in without a trial. You can read the rest of the story. They put us in without a trial. Uh, and, and we're Romans too. And guess what? They can come and tell us we're free to go. And all of a sudden, those old boys knew they crossed the line. Where was that mob rule spirit then to come in? And they did just that. They, they come in and besought him and said, please, leave quietly. Sometimes we'll be given audience. Acts 17, verse 5, But the Jews which believed not moved with envy. Hmm. How many people are going to see what's going on? How many times is that spirit going to see that, you know what, you got some things going on. I'm telling you, down here we have been going head to head with the spirit of envy. And you know what? That turkey's going to fall too. Took them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar. All the city in an uproar. A few people. What is going on with this Antifa thing? I just watched a, a clip. This young man was sitting at a Dallas restaurant having a nice dinner a mixed crowd, you know, there were people from all races at this thing and open outside, it looked like a great place. I, I was thinking, wow, I need to find out where that is. If I get to Dallas, I might want to go. Yet, these knuckleheads, these people of a baser, how, how did they put that? Lewd fellows come by and started chanting. They started their stuff and they worked up and they started throwing things. Pretty soon, everybody's evening was ruined. The cops come in with tear gas and everything, and they're going, look, this is ridiculous. 
this is ridiculous. Why are you doing this? We were having a good time. We are enjoying our lives. Leave us alone. No, they can't do that. That spirit wants to work things up, right? They were moved to envy and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And it's amazing that, that they went through, you can read the rest of the story, how, how Jason had to go in, he had to put post bail and everything else because he was hiding someone. Verse 10, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night to Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Look at verse 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul and Berea, they came thither and, also, and stirred up the people. They come in from other towns, other cities, and stirred things up. Where have we heard that before? Same spirit. Same spirit. Same thing going on. And you can go through many of these. Acts 18 and verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, in verse 3, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for their occupation, they were tent makers. He found somebody there that was a fellow tent maker, and they went into business for a little while. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Yeshua was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his garment and said unto them, Your blood's upon your heads. I'm clean from henceforth. I will go unto the Gentiles. Paul said, that's enough. I'm done with the synagogues. I'm going to somebody that's going to receive me. And that's where he made a turn in his ministry, right? You can look at... Uh, uh, Acts 19, 25 through 41, Ephesus was in an uproar. Acts 21, turn there, Acts 21, 10. I got to, I got to move along. 21, 10. And we tarried there many days and there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. Now, let me shorten up the story a little bit for time. Agabus come in and they took the belt off of Paul and he bound his hands, bound his feet, gave him a prophecy and said, if you go down to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound and led away. Now, what did Paul say? And this is the, this is the point that we've got to get to. And Paul answered, verse 13, what mean ye to weep and break my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. I said it earlier, unless, until you're ready to die, you can't truly live. You've got to come to grips with that, folks. Fear of death will hinder you. It will hold you back from living every day the way you're made to live. And then Paul was arrested in, in verse 30. And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and they drew him out of the temple. And the forthwith the doors were shut and they went about to kill him. Once again, he's probably going, here we go again. I can feel the rocks. He probably saw the kids gathering up rocks. There was probably some young enterprising somebody that had rocks for sale right there close. That same spirit stirring things up. We're seeing it over and over and over again today. So what's what's the case? What's the remedy? Matthew 24, 9. Let's go over there real quick. Matthew 24, 9.
Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my sake. Then, after they do that, then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Don't we see that going on right now? Could we not say that we may be at that point in this scripture? Very well, could be. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. No, no, peace, peace. There's a great revival coming. There's this, that, whatever. And because iniquity, what is the root word of iniquity? Torahlessness. The absence of Torah, lawlessness, however you want to say it, sin. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's why we're seeing this from the church house to the White House to everything else, every other house in between, the legislature, things are running amok because we've left the principles of the creator, the timeless wisdom that's encapsulated within Torah, and we've went our own way and we've given ourselves over to a spirit that likes to stir things up. And that's exactly where it is. Verse 13. Underline this. Put it on your refrigerator. Whatever you got to do. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We've got to endure. We've got to overcome. We've got to be there to the finish line. Don't let your faith be shaken so that you take the mark. Or make a decision that could destroy you eternally. Yeshua said, don't fear those who can only take away your life. But fear him who not only can destroy your life, but can destroy your spirit as well. Him fear. There's a day of reckoning coming. And it's not going to be pretty for millions and millions of people. They'll be resurrected to the great white throne judgment and eternally gone. Snuffed out of existence because they denied the Father. Okay? Twenty-one through twenty-five. Twenty-four, Matthew twenty-four, twenty-one. For then shall be great, great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time nor never shall be and except those days be shortened we were talking about this the other day too and there should be no flesh saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened brothers and sisters the time's coming we will make it you know what some of us may get to go home and rest early some of us may go all the way, but make sure you endure. No matter where your story ends, it always takes back up. If you're in the right position, you're either going to be one of two places, raised in the resurrection of the just or the unjust. You're either going to be a sheep or you're going to be a goat. Make sure, and if you don't know, contact one of our team right into Ephraim International Ministries, make sure you know how your story ends. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord. And what did he say? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. I don't want to hear that for myself. I don't want to hear that for you. Make sure that you know the question without any questions make sure you know the end and that's where we've got to go you know you can as as side study look into uh, uh, Matthew 10 and, and in fact I want to do that real quickly in closing I know I'm running real real tight on time Matthew 10 and we're going to just hit a highlight point here 
in verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, but ye therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but beware of men. We learned that lesson down here recently. Make three copies, press hard. Don't trust anybody. They may come on to you and look like they're on your side. You know what? At the end of the day, you got to make sure who's on your side. For they will deliver you up to the councils that will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought for what you will speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. Verse 21, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. That's twice that Yeshua said that personally. Endure to the end. It's a sad thing. We see that in the news all the time lately. Children and, and folks, families turning against each other. For what? A perceived wrong? Two wrongs don't make a right, folks. Two wrongs do not make a right. And if we could figure that out, we'd be, we'd be miles ahead. I'm going to go ahead and pray now. Uh, we're going to do something very special. I want to, we've had a lot of uh, uh, folks that have received healings, and, and you've received a touch, and, and things are going along great. And then how many of you would say, you know what? The enemy tried to come in to destroy it and steal it and take away what God has given. And what I want to do right now, I'm not going to pray again that you're healed again because you're already healed. You are healed. You have been. So what is this? We're going to come against the spirit, this same little ugly spirit that's trying to come around and steal what the Father has given to you. And I'm going to pray for a fresh infilling of power that you may be able to resist all the efforts of the enemy and that you will be victorious. Because as I said to somebody the other night, the enemy doesn't want us to get out and have all these miraculous stories of deliverance, of healing, of everything else. He can't have that. Because if that breaks out, people may develop faith. They may inquire, what are you guys doing that the church isn't doing? Why do I not see this over here? But you guys, it's commonplace to have miraculous shows of the Spirit. We're in the crosshairs, brothers and sisters. If you come to this and you accept Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, and you take hold of the Father's covenant and love the Lord our God with all your might, all your strength, everything that's within you, all your heart, you're in the crosshairs. Let's, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, right now, deliver that anointing to everyone. And if you've had something that was going on, just reach out and claim it. Powers of darkness, I command you right now to cease and desist your activities. You are trying to deceive these precious children of the Most High into thinking and planting a seed of doubt. I break that in the name of Yeshua. I command you to stop. 
Leave them alone. Father God, right now, reach out with your power and your Holy Spirit. Father God, from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, I can feel right now that anointing going through. It's kind of like lava. It's like this, this Holy Ghost lava is flowing through every organ, every lymph node, every system. And Father God is absolutely recharging every part of you. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in the lives. I command the anointing to go in and give them the strength, the power to stand up against the wiles of the enemy. Father God, in the name of Yeshua, I praise you. Yeah, I can feel this thing just I'm getting something, somebody, and this is on beyond that. Somebody's got something in back of their right eye. I don't know. If it, I'm almost getting like a little tumor or something. You've been having trouble. The, the eye sore. Put your hand on that eye. If you're having trouble with your eyes, Father God, in the name of Yeshua, I curse this condition that's come into this eye. And I command that it be healed in the name of Yeshua. That it would not affect the vision in any way, shape, or form. In fact, through the power of the anointing, it will be better vision than ever before. More clear, more sharp. In Yeshua's name, be healed. Be healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, I can still feel that anointing running. Just sit there, bask in it. Praise God for victory. You have been healed. You have been restored. And the Father has delivered you. You didn't lose your healing. It was yours from the foundation of the universe. The enemy has come in and tried to steal. And it's broken. It's done. God didn't allow it in heaven. He's not allowing it here. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the victory for each and every one of us. Everything that we're going through, thank you for the victory. In the name of Yeshua. Shout it out, brothers and sisters. Victory. Victory. Hallelujah. Well, thank you. I praise God. I'm looking forward to hearing the testimonies of the healings. We had to do this. And uh, yeah, bless God. Go forward in the strength and the power of that anointing in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Be blessed, brothers and sisters. I thank you. And uh, see you next week. Amen.